Father in heaven, Lord, it's such an amazing honor, Lord, to be able to share your word with your children, Lord, and to be able to preach it all around the world. Lord, it's such a beautiful honor to see those that have given their lives to you today through baptism and rebaptism, and, and even those, Lord, that are coming in the future that we know wasn't able to do it today, but they're going to be doing it soon. We thank you for those decisions and for all that you have done here at this evangelistic series. Many seeds have been sown. Many hearts have been won to you. And Lord, we, we couldn't be more happy. And we know, Lord, that heaven is rejoicing, seeing all of the, the, um, the labor that is being done here, Lord, come to fruition and uh, for the people to give their lives to you. And so, Lord, as we study your word now, and as we kind of close out this evangelistic series uh, with today's message, I pray that you'll bless us and help us to know you more through the study of this word and to understand your character more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, I hope your Bibles are open to Luke chapter 5. And we're going to look at our scripture reading, Luke chapter 5 and verse 39. Luke chapter 5 and verse 39. If you have your Bibles, please turn to them. If you don't have a Bible, go find one because you're going to want to follow along. This is going to be an awesome message, but it's going to be shorter than what we're used to. Luke 5, 39. Jesus has an awesome, amazing statement here, and he kind of tells three rapid parables in rapid succession, but I'm going to focus on the last statement that he makes in verse 39 in chapter 5. He says this, No man, also having drunk old wine, straightway desireth the new. He says, For he saith, The old is better. So Jesus is making a very obvious statement here that he would say, no man, having drunk old what? Wine. Old wine. Now, what is old wine? It's fermented, intoxicating beverage, right? It's a fermented, intoxicating beverage that, that a, a person or a drunkard or someone would drink that would be addicted to that. And so he says, no man, having drunk old wine, straight away, or as some Bible translations say, immediately desires the new, because he says that the old is better. Now, I think that this statement that Jesus says is very profound. I think that, that the profundity of this statement really lays the foundation for how Jesus is planning on saving you and me. And, and not only that, how Jesus is, is trying to explain to us how his character judges you and me on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, for those of you that got baptized today, this message, I want to let you know, is specifically for you, but it's also for those of you that, that have been baptized in the past, and you may be going through a struggle in your life. You may be going through uh, problems in your life. The message that, that we have titled it this morning is titled, The Struggle. The, the what? Struggle. The Struggle. Do we struggle? Yes. Do Christians struggle? Yes. You better believe it. You better believe Christians struggle. And so Jesus makes a statement here. He says, no man having drunk old wine straight away desires the new, for he says that the old is better. Now I'm going to tell you that the quick message I'm going give to you, give you this morning I wish I would have heard when I first was baptized and gave my life to Jesus. Because sometimes in our Christian walk, when we're baptized and we give our lives to Jesus, we know what we need to do, right? We know that we need to stay connected to Jesus, and we know that we don't, we don't need to sin anymore. We know that we need to have victory over sin. We know that we need to stop following the ways of the world. We know these things. The Holy Spirit teaches us and tells us that every single day. But the problem is, is the struggle is real. How many of you know what I'm talking about? On a day-to-day -day basis, the struggle of, of saying no to sin and yes to Jesus is a real struggle. Because there's a devil and he's tempting us every single day of our life. And the struggle seems so difficult at times that we can get discouraged. And back in 2015, I was traveling in the ministry and um, I did not have a full-time job. I was barely making any money at all. But I was traveling full-time. My wife and I was really wanting to give our lives to the Lord full-time. Right out of high school, we went straight into Amazing Facts, and we started doing the ministry work through Amazing Facts, doing evangelism, doing Bible work, giving personal Bible studies, in-home Bible studies, and doing public evangelistic seminars. But I was barely making any money to even live off of. And how many of you know what it's like when you're barely making any money at all? Life gets tough sometimes when you're dealing with those financial struggles, right? And, and you know you got to have money to, to live. you got to have money to pay your bills. you got to have money to, I mean, to, to, to save for a future so you can buy a home, especially when you're young people. you know, you got to have a home for your wife. you got to have a home for your family. And, and all the struggles of life was really getting real for me. But yet I knew that I had to stay faithful to God. I knew that I needed to stay faithful to God. But 
Long story short, what happened was that all of these things, all of these struggles, all of the, 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 the struggles of finances and the struggles of everything started to become very overwhelming to me. And what happened was that, beloved, listen, even as a minister in the church, I started to almost give up on God. Are you with me? This is just in 2015, not just a few years ago. I almost gave up on God, almost gave up on His Word, almost gave up on everything, all because the struggles that I was going through was so surreal, so, so, oh man, so overwhelming on my life at the time that I almost gave up on everything. How many of you have been there before? Man, the struggle gets so real and you start questioning things. You're like, God, my life isn't going the way I thought it would go. And I thought, Lord, that that all these things would happen and you start, the struggle just gets overwhelming. Well, that's what happened in my life, and I almost gave up on everything, but then I listened to a message, and it's the message that I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. Very quick, very easy message, but let's get into it now. Jesus says, no man, having drunk old wine, straight away desires the new, for he says that the old is better. You see, friends, if we were to go to Hot Springs, in, the, in downtown Hot Springs or wherever you would like to go, and we were to find a, an inebriated man on the side of the street, a, a man who's a drunkard, who is addicted to alcohol, who's addicted to that old wine, who's addicted to that old fermented beverage. And we were to go to him and we were to say, hey, brother, wake up, you know, and we help him up to his feet. Come on up, brother, get up. We got something wonderful for you. And we hand him a fresh bottle of Welch's grape juice. Uh-oh. <laughs> and we give him that fresh bottle of Welch's grape juice and he drinks it. How many of you think that his response is going to be, whoa, this is great stuff, man. I wish I had this my whole life. Oh, this is much better than that stuff I drink every day. You think that's going to be his response? Just do this right here. No, that's not going to be his response. His response is probably going to be like, oh, that's okay, but I'd like to have the old better. Right? And the reason why he does not desire the new, because the old is what he's used to. The old is better. To him, it's what he's always known. And he can imagine drinking anything else other than the old. So Jesus is saying, no man having drunk old wine straight away or immediately desires the new, for he says the old is better. The key word in this text is straight away or immediately. The reason why I say that is because, you see, if you take the word straight away or immediately out of this text, then you have a totally different understanding. If you take straight away or immediately out of this text, then you have no hope. You have no what? No hope. Jesus was saying that no man, having drunk old wine, immediately, straight away, desires new. Because he says that the old is better. He's addicted to the old. But Jesus is not insinuating that that person who's addicted to old wine cannot like and desire the new. Can you say amen? Can an alcoholic become sober? Absolutely, but does it happen immediately? And that's the point Jesus is making. So, in other words, what Jesus is saying is that that person who's addicted to that old wine can learn to like the new wine. It just doesn't happen overnight. Are you with me? It just doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. It's a process. So, let's see if... Jesus' statement of our sanctification walk with him is synonymous with the writings of Paul. Go in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to see if Paul agrees with Jesus in this statement in, in, in the gospel or in, in the statement of the New Testament that he makes here. Second Corinthians chapter, uh, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1. And we're going to go to verse 16. Now, notice what Paul says here. This is a very famous Bible verse. It's kind of a a foundation for what the gospel is. It says here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says, For therein, therein what? Therein the gospel of Christ is the righteousness of God revealed from what? From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Shall live by faith. So, Notice what Paul's saying here in the book of Romans. He's going through and he's explaining to the Romans the gospel of Christ. And he says the gospel of Christ is being revealed. The righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to what? Faith. 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 Now, how many of you have ever heard the Christian experience referred to as the Christian run? Nobody, right? 
What do we call it? We don't call it the, Christ, the Christian run or the Christian jog. What do we call it? The Christian walk, right? The Christian walk. And so when we think about the Christian walk, we call it a walk because you don't just learn how to walk overnight, do you? When you're a baby and you're starting off, you don't even know how to walk. You barely have any, any, any mobility at all to move. Your, your muscles have to develop. So after you feed and after you spend time feeding, eventually you start getting enough muscles to crawl, right? And then crawling, turn, crawl, crawling turns into walking, right? And, and, and then walking turns into other things. But we know the Christian experience is referred to as the Christian walk, and there's a reason behind that. Because you see, friends, you and I don't learn how to walk, don't learn how to use our bodies properly, don't learn how to function properly overnight, it takes what? Time. And so notice the message here. He's saying, for therein the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to faith. You know what Paul's describing? The sanctification experience of a Christian. That the righteousness of God, which is what you and I have to have, by the way, is being revealed from, notice, faith to faith. In other words, notice this, beloved, from one level of faith to the next level of faith, you draw closer to Jesus, right? Right? From one level of faith to the next level of faith. Let me ask you a question. Your faith right now, can it be compared in any way to be, you know, in, in unity with your faith when, before you accepted Jesus or right when you accepted Jesus? No. Not at all. Because, you see, you grew from faith to what? Faith. To faith. Your, your faith when you first accepted Christ is not like the faith that you have now. Because your faith has grown. But did that happen immediately or did it happen over time? It happened over time. So, so the more time you spend with Jesus, you have from faith to faith, you experience the love of God. You experience his, his righteousness. And because you experience his righteousness from faith to faith, from one level of faith to the next level of faith, you want to surrender your life to Jesus and you become more obedient to his word. Can you say amen? amen. But the obedience to God's word doesn't happen immediately all the time. Sometimes it comes in stages, growth periods. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Let me give you an example. How many of you, when you were baptized and you gave your life to Jesus, you never made a mistake after your baptism? Come on, right? We, we know after your baptism, you've probably fallen many times and you've lost count. Because the, the reality is, you deal with the struggle. The struggle's real. Can you say amen? amen. But God is real also. So there's good news at the end of this message, so stick, stick by. Now let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's look at what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, text here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 18. Paul, again, is writing to the church of Corinth, and he's ma he makes a, a fabulous, awesome, magnificent statement here in verse 18. He says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we're beholding it as in, a, as in a glass, the what? The glory of the Lord, and we're being changed into the same image. The same image of who? Of Jesus. From glory to glory. So, so follow this with me. Paul says, therein the righteousness of Christ is being revealed from faith to faith in Romans 1.17. From one level of faith to the next level of faith, he says, and we all are beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from glory to glory. That is, beloved, listen to me. That is from one level of Christian character development to the next level of Christian character development. Can someone say amen? Amen. 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 So are you following with me? So Paul, is what Paul's describing, is it the Christian experience? The Christian walk? I'm going to wait till you wake up. Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to take a nap too? Is what Paul's describing the Christian walk, the Christian experience? Yes. yes, beloved. He's describing the Christian experience, the Christian walk. And I love this because he's saying that it's from glory to glory, from faith to faith. You and I come to Christ. You and I become Christians from faith to faith, from glory to glory. We become transformed into that same image of Jesus. Isn't that good news? What if Jesus said, you don't have time. You do it now. 
How many of you would be going to heaven right now? None of us. Can you say amen? amen? But see, Jesus understands you need time. You need time. And so he is going to use that time to transform you into his likeness, into his character. Now notice this again. Go with me over to, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just a page over in your Bible. And let's look at verse 16 now, and let's look at what Paul says here. He says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by what? Day. Hold on a second. He said the inward man is what? Renewed. All oh, beloved, beloved, beloved. What is the root word of renew? New. So what you see is that Jesus is saying, you and I are made new, how often? Day by day. Are you with me? See, friends, it's like working on an old car. You can't get that old car fixed up into its original look overnight. It takes time. Day by day, you get the rim shined up. You get the bumper shined up. You get everything restored, the body restored. Then you got to go inside and get the engine restored. Are you with me, beloved? It takes time, and, and it doesn't happen immediately. Is this agreeing with what, Paul, what Jesus said, rather, in Luke 5, 39? No man having drunk old wine immediately or straight away desires the new. Why? Because the old is better. You see, friends, the reality is, is that the reason why we struggle so much is because we have been thrown into a world of sin. And from the moment that you and I were a baby, we have been trained and we have been beholding and we have been hearing this world of sin. And this world of sin has been, has been molding and framing our minds and then we become sinful. We take on those sin, the sinful tendencies and propensities to do evil by hearing and dwelling among the wicked. Are you with me? And so by the time we are actually to the point to where we start or being interested in spiritual things, we are corrupted. And God has to make us new. But he understands that you are drunk. You like that old wine. Let's be honest, right? Many people, they can't seem to get off the old wine because that's what you've always been on. You're addicted to it. But you can, Jesus says, you can like the new wine. It just doesn't happen, what? Immediately. Over time, the more time you spend with Jesus, you become like Jesus. The more time you open his word and you give him your time, your adoration, and your attention, Jesus transforms your character over time. And then you look back, 30 years later, and you say, man, when I first accepted Jesus, I didn't know anything. But now when I, now I look back on my journey and I can say, I know Jesus so much more better than I knew him then. Amen? Amen. You become transformed. You see, because we all struggle, we have a problem, and that problem is sin. And that, that's what makes the struggle so real. But Jesus is saying, I can cause you to like the new wine. Let me give you a scripture here that a lot of people don't like in the Bible, but it's actually a very true scripture. Go over with me to Proverbs 24. Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24, we're going to look at verse 16. Say a good amen when you're there. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16. Are we there? Amen? Let's read it together. Notice what the proverb says. It says, for a just man falleth how many times? Seven. Seven times, and it says, and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Now, now i got a question, beloved. What is the difference between a just man and a wicked man? Oh, somebody said it. Come on. Say it real loud, Miss Jan. The just man gets back up. You see, beloved, what Satan wants you to do is he wants to get you to fall. And the reality is, more than likely, he will get you to fall. But when you fall, 
You have a choice to make. A just man who says, you know what, I'm not perfect, but I'm on my way to perfection. You can't stay down in order to be perfect like the Lord. Can you say amen? You have to get back up. You have to get back up. So the difference between the just man and the wicked man is the wicked man falls and he stays down. He doesn't ever get back up, which is exactly what the devil wants you and I to do when we fall, when we stumble, when we make a mistake. Let me illustrate this for you. You see, beloved, can I fall in this position? No. 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 Why? Because I've already fallen. I'm already down. This is where the devil wants you to be. Can you say amen? This is where the devil wants you to be. Where does God want you to be? He wants you to be up and on that narrow path. But the devil wants to encourage you to fall. And then when he gets you to fall, here comes the devil and he's going to say, See, why do you keep getting up? Because this is what happens to you all the time. You fall and you fall and you fall. You'll never get there, so why don't you just stay down? Stop embarrassing yourself. And after hearing that so many times, you think to yourself, Oh boy. You know, yeah, he's right. I, I should just stay down. I, I'm making a fool of myself. And maybe God will forgive me while I'm staying down. Friends, that's not the gospel. No. The gospel is that a just man, though he fall, he rises up again. Can you say amen? amen? Now, here's the deal. Here's the thing I want you to realize. I don't know where you are in your Christian walk. You may have went so far and fallen, and you may be down even right now and you have no intention to get back up. But here's the thing I want you to realize. The longer you stay in this position, the more comfortable you will get. You'll get so comfortable that you'll eventually reach over and grab a pillow. You'll pull up the blankets, and the devil will have you here for the rest of your life. And then you will sadly miss out on the second coming of Jesus. But friends, beloved, if you will listen to the Holy Spirit, realizing that, no, you are not perfect, but your God is. And if you will listen to him and get back up, can you say amen? Amen. Never heard a laying down preacher before, have you? (laughs) If you will get back up and follow on that narrow path, God will deliver you. And eventually, the, the times that you fall will become less and less. You, you, that one sin that's been taking you by storm and you've just been boom, 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 boom. You've been falling left and right. That one sin will eventually be like boom, 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 boom. And then one day, you'll get up and walk straight away from that sin. Can you say amen? But you can't walk away from it if you stay down. Let me illustrate it this way. How many of you like to go canoeing? You like to canoe? I like to canoe too. Well, let's say we went canoeing on a canoe trip together. And as we're out there canoeing in Manitoba, Canada, we're going down the river. We're enjoying our time together. We're canoeing. We're in our canoes. It's a beautiful sunny day. Can you see it? All the river's shining and crystal clear. And the trout and the fishes are swimming right along. Oh, it's a beautiful day. Here's option A. We're in our canoes. And all of a sudden, we hear a boom. And we look down, and we see a dead body floating like this. That's option A. How many of you would like to be a part of that scenario? Nobody, right? So imagine it like this now. Now we're in our canoes. It's a different day. Option B. We're going down the river, having a good time. There's the bear scratching his back on the tree. Oh, it's a beautiful bear. Squirrels are running through the trees, playing with their acorns. The turtles are up on the logs, enjoying their nice day. And all of a sudden, we look up, and we see a person in the process of drowning. And they're screaming, help! (laughs) And they're screaming, help! And we see the person drowning. Out of those two scenarios, which one would you rather be a part of? The second one, option B, why? Because you can save them. There's help. There's still hope. Can you say amen? With the first scenario, they're already dead. There's no hope. With the second scenario, although they may be in the process of dying, they're still alive, so there's still hope. So here's the thing I want to share with you. Although you see the person struggling, how many of you are struggling? 
Struggle's real, isn't it? Although you see the person struggling, here's the deal. The struggle itself is a sign of life. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You may be struggling, friends, and I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what you're going through. But the struggle that you're going through itself is a sign of life, which means there's still hope for you today. You see, friends, the only way we're going to be able to overcome the sin in our life, and those of you getting bat- that got baptized today, those of you that will be getting baptized in the future, the only way you will be able to continue on that narrow path is for you to keep your eyes on Jesus. You see, sin is the transgression of the law. And our carnal man likes to break the law. Our carnal man is bound by the law. But our spiritual man is not. Are you with me? So, remember when Peter was on the water with Jesus? As long as Peter kept his eyes on Christ, he overcome the law. What law? The law of gravity. You see, it's impossible for Peter to walk on water. But when, when Peter, when the, when the disciples, they saw Jesus and they thought he was some kind of ghost or something, then they, he said, hey, it is I, be not afraid. Peter saw an opportunity and he said, Lord, if it is you, command that I come out there with you. Peter wanted to see if he can do what his Lord could do. That's what you and I should be doing. We should look to the life of Christ and say, I want to do what Jesus did. And in, here's the deal. In order for Peter to be able to do what Christ did, he had to have faith to take his first step out of the boat. And can you imagine his expression? As long as his eyes were on Jesus, beloved, he overcame the law of gravity. He did the impossible. And as long as your eyes are on Jesus, you can do the same as Peter. But if you take your eyes off Jesus the way Peter did, All you have to do is do what Peter did. Cry out, Lord, save me. And the hand of Jesus will be there to pull you back up on top of the water again to do the impossible again. Can you say amen, beloved? Amen. Amen. So, my message in closing, my last final thought, is that the only way to keep your eyes on Jesus is to Facebook. I don't say no, say yes. That's the only way to keep your eyes on Jesus is to Facebook. You see, here's the deal. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, in order for us to keep our eyes on Jesus, where must we look? So you and I need to get our face... In the book, we need to face book. And the more that we face book, the more that we will be like Jesus. Here's the deal. The more we like this, like this, smiley face emoticon this, the more that we share this, And the more that we comment on this, we will have victory over sin day by day. Faith to faith. Glory to glory. How many of you say that's my desire here this this morning? Praise God. So I want to encourage you, my beloved friends, always Facebook with Jesus. Share God in your life. Get your head in the book. And the more that you Facebook, the more your life will become just like his. Amen? Amen. 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 Pastor Ron, you want, us, you want me to pray? Okay, brother. <laughs> let's have a word of prayer, and let's close out this service and thank Jesus for what he has done. Father in heaven, God, we thank you and we praise your holy name. Lord, we have learned in this presentation that, Lord, you have mercy upon us. You are long-suffering to us not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. 
And Lord, we thank you for giving us the most gracious gift ever. Not only your son Jesus, Father, but you've given us time. Time to be transformed into the likeness of your son Jesus. Time to be found hid in your son Jesus. That when you look upon us, you see not sinner. You see not a sinner. You see a saint. You see not us. You see Jesus living in us. And that the pardon that he paid for us on Calvary's cross, Lord, sets us free from the wages of sin. Because, Lord, we can have eternal life with you now. So, Lord, we thank you for this word you have given us and how you have delivered this truth to us. And as we continue on, Lord, this narrow path, although we may struggle, help us to remember that the struggle itself is a sign of a life. And that although the struggle is real, you are even more real. And that the, your gospel of your son Jesus can abide in our hearts if we will but Facebook with you daily. We pray and we ask you all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.